So first of all, I have all my slides and links and related resources at this bit.ly link. It's in the InstructureCon course and it's on my Twitter feed. So you can follow along or follow up. You don't have to try to scribble or grab screenshots. Uh, but I want to emphasize that the ideas I want to share with you today are not finished products. They are starting points for your own thinking, your own adapting, your own innovating in your context. Let me tell you a little bit more about our context, uh, our school, and uh, where we're coming from as context for what we're trying and what we're asking in our program. We have about 300 students pursuing degrees for ordained ministry, uh, other positions in church education, and doctoral study. We're a seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and we're about two years into our distance learning program. And we launched this a couple years ago. At that point, we realized that we needed a new LMS. We needed a robust but user-friendly LMS for an online learning environment. We were on Angel. That wasn't it. We found Canvas. That was it. And we've never looked back. We've, uh, we've gotten positive feedback uh, across the board. In our distance learning program, we now offer our core degrees entirely through hybrid courses, which are primarily online, but have a required one-week residency per semester. So we think the combination of online and face-to-face -face is essential, but the bulk of a semester is spent online. We have um, many of our students, both distance and residential, but especially distance, are second, third career students. They have careers. They have families. And as you know, if you work with adult learners, they're looking for adaptability, flexibility. Above all, they're looking for meaningful connection and practical application to their current professional setting, future <coughs> professional settings. And that's a great reminder for us, and it's a good check for us, that we have to keep innovating. So my role is as instructional designer, collaborating with faculty to design their hybrid courses, including the online components. And I draw not only on my experience as an instructional designer, but also my experience as an online student, taking online courses for my master's in education, and the positives and negatives that I take away from that. Now, in the bulk of the courses I've worked on as a designer, and just about every course I've taken as an online student, the heart and soul of the online course has been the discussion thread. And it's so essential and so prevalent that I think we have to ask, is there a danger that after a while we are over-relying on the discussion thread? And if so, are we starting to experience diminishing returns? My answer is yes. In fact, the way I would put it is that we risk going from thread to thud as discussions start to land with a thud. Part of the problem is how this has looked historically. In the old bad LMSs, this was pretty ugly. It looked like a bad email platform, which essentially it was. And you have your posts, and you have your replies, and you have your replies to replies. And as they pile up, and they start to sprawl and clutter, and it's not a very inviting environment. It's a very intimidating and disorienting environment. And perhaps most importantly, it doesn't look like dialogue. It doesn't look like a conversation. It looks like a stack. In Canvas, at least, it looks nice. Everything is very cleanly laid out, cleanly designed. All my demos for our tutorials have Star Wars characters, and that was before I even knew about this, what the theme of this conference. So when the stormtroopers showed up the other day, that, uh, that warmed my heart. But everything looks good. It's very cleanly spaced, um, and it looks more like conversation. It looks more like social media, which is one of the things that drew us to Canvas. But even if it looks nice, there's a risk in repeating the same format too much. There's a risk in repeating the same prompt too much. I can't tell you how many times this has been the prompt for discussions that I've been in as a student. And after a while, when you see it over and over, agree or disagree, why or why not, uh, at this point, I can write you a very dry, detached academic paragraph for agreeing or disagreeing with just about anything. <laughs> um, and the problem is, it doesn't tell you if I'm learning, and it doesn't tell you if it's meaningful to me or not because I've just been so conditioned by the format. And when you step back, it really makes you wonder, is the reality of online learning living up to the hype? We say we're going to leverage technology in new and innovative ways, but are we really? Are we really thinking innovatively, or are we actually repeating past mistakes? I love pointing to a paper by Bauer and colleagues I have linked to there. You can follow, uh, follow up the reference. They talk about the four main pedagogical modes transmissive, dialogic, constructionist, co-constructive. Delivery, discourse, development, and collaboration. And they call for a balance. 
Well, historically, the classroom setting, the classroom education that I experienced, uh, the first mode was predominant, almost to the exclusion of others. Transmiss it. The sage on the stage transmitting the information. But now I wonder if we're at a point in the online environment where we're actually seeing a dominance of the second mode, the dialogic. And we're not seeing a healthy balance. Uh, Bauer and colleagues say, we need to have a balance, maybe not an equal proportion among these four, but it's a healthy exercise to see how much of these modes are represented or activated in our e-learning design. So it's important to vary it up. We need balance, we need a healthy proportion, uh, whether you're online or residential. He, he's brewing canvas there, by the way. I don't know if you saw that, but that's, that was important to me to, uh, to show that. There's a danger that we're over-relying on one mode. There's a danger even that what we think of as dialogic isn't really, that it's actually transmissive in disguise. A lot of discussion threads are probably more aptly described as serial monologues rather than actual dialogues. A point of feedback we're getting from our online students is that after a number of discussions, and I sympathize as an online student myself, the interaction in a discussion thread feels very artificial. It doesn't feel like an actual interaction. It feels like I'm lining up to make my post, I'm lining up to make mine. Even if it's structured as a reply, is it actual dialogue, or are we actually back to just a, dif a different kind of a transmissive mode? A paper in Computers and Education put this rather alarmingly, I think. It looked at online courses and found, quote, a prevalence of one-way, individualistic, and superficial interactions. Ouch. They even found a negative correlation between the proportion of the final grade that was devoted to discussion and what they define and measure as knowledge-constructive interactions. In other words, it's not that simple. It's not automatic. I was listening to a webinar once where a distance learning director was saying, in our online program, we create community by having discussion boards, period. And, and I wanted to do this. It's not that simple. Uh, to me, that's like saying in a traditional classroom format, we create community in our traditional setting by building four walls and putting desks and chairs in, among them, and we get community. Well, you have created an environment in which dialogue, interaction, collaboration, and community are possible, but you're not there yet. You've got to be intentional, and you've got to be creative. So, what I've done is compile a list of ideas just to get the brainstorming motor running. I call it our idea box. I put it at my blog called Portable Pedagogy. And it's currently at 53 different ideas and activities for online learning, or blended learning, or hybrid, or flipped, or traditional. You can use them and adapt them for any setting. Currently at 53, always growing. When I get home from this conference, it'll probably be at about 253 after what I've been hearing and absorbing over the last couple days. But I take this from our experience, our brainstorming, and outside sources that I'll refer to along the way. So grab the link, follow them up. Again, I cannot guarantee that these are good ideas. I cannot guarantee that they are workable ideas. But my goal is to expand the range of what we think of as possible in online learning design. I would summarize our approaches, uh, our, our approaches in regard to the discussion thread uh, in, in three ways. We tried to tame the thread, simply make it more manageable for instructors and students alike, tweak the thread, change the kind of response we're trying to get from students, shake things up a little bit, or cut the thread. Because it is possible, it is possible to actually cut the discussion thread completely. Once you perceive this, it will change how you see reality. But we try to do some of each. So I want to walk through a few of them, and I've tried to sort them according to what I call pedagogical values. These are recurring values that I saw creeping up again and again as I looked over the list that we have compiled so far. These probably map on very directly and very easily to values and outcomes that you've identified in your curriculum. Uh, one I call distribution of labor. This started out as a practical or pragmatic value, uh, but it's also a pedagogical value. We don't need to have each and every student doing the exact same thing um, and just repeating everything. They can do different roles. And the pedagogical value becomes as you do that, they become accountable to each other. You get more collaboration. This is sometimes called jigsaw, something like that. Um, and you raise the stakes. Uh, there's very little at stake 
in the average student contribution in the conventional setup. In fact, I isolated that as a separate value. How do we make students feel that what they're doing in a particular assignment is of increased importance? Rhetorical register, how do we push our students to get out of that default, dry, academic voice, try to find their own voice, or try to adopt another voice as an exercise that increases their rhetorical skill? Oral presentation with such dominance on written expression, with it, which is important in many curricula, we need more balance. We need oral presentation skill. Can we do that online? I have a couple ideas. Visual fluency, our visual learners are in this environment where everything is so verbal. We've got to uh, play to their strengths and develop those strengths in others. And wider net, as in literally the internet. So many courses are sort of self-contained areas, and so many L LMSs are self-contained. Canvas gives us the direction to connect with that wider net out there. All right, a few examples along the way, and then I want to hear yours at the end as well. One of the first things we tried, sort of out of necessity in the category of distribution of labor, is what we call expert reports. We had a course that went through all 66 books of the Bible, 1 through 66. We were adapting it for a nine-week summer term. It was impossible for each student to uh, encounter 66 sources the same way in that span of time. So each week, each student gets assigned a book in which they are the expert. They engage with the primary and secondary sources more extensively. They post something on a discussion thread and field inquiries and feedback from other students. We actually like sticking with the discussion thread as a piece of furniture, so to speak, as an item in the online space, but we like to use it in different ways. Certainly, especially with Canvas, you can leverage different kinds of uh, tools, wikis, uh, peer review and submissions, uh, collaborations with Google Docs. Uh, but for us, sometimes we only like to change one variable at a time. So we'll use the same format, discussion thread, but ask students to do something else. And then sometimes we cut the thread completely. So expert reports divide and conquer, make it more manageable for everyone. Similarly, facilitate the facilitators. For large classes especially, breaking them up into groups, as I'm sure you've tried if you've been using Canvas, um, and designating one of the students to be a facilitator or co-facilitator for the week, and then those roles rotate. In Canvas, it's so easy to set up the groups. You create your groups. You click on your assignment settings. This is a group assignment. The student has access to the discussion thread for their group. Uh, you as teacher or admin see them all. I will say as much as we like groups, uh, we found a little hiccup in the group design, which is that, as you know, as you may know, structurally, groups are set up as a course within a course or a separate area from the course. And the default design doesn't visually distinguish that very well. So I wrote up a couple lines of JavaScript that inserts this message box on top of every group page. It says, this is a group area, it's members only, here's a button to get back to the course. You can grab the code there, hand it to your local admin, and put it in your Canvas instance. This has greatly reduced student confusion about the group navigation, and it's made us more confident that we can use groups in assignments and not run into problems. So Canvas will improve this natively sometime, I'm confident, but until then, you have to put up with hacks from the likes of me uh, to get there. Um, but the end result is, is distributing that effort and getting uh, group interaction. Yes? Excellent. Love it. Perfect, so that, that math, maps on. The comment is about group leaders coming up in future iterations of Canvas, so that'll be built in, the facilitation distribution. Well, sometimes we want students to write their posts, but one professor said just to break the rhythm of everybody having to write everything out, what if we said, we're gonna have groups, but you're gonna each do group hangouts? Uh, and we do like the collaborations tool with the big blue button tie-in, when it comes to small groups, everybody loves to just jump on Google Hangout. And so they arrange a time for that to happen. Uh, they, they have their video chat. This is the most direct way we've found, one of the most direct ways, to get students to switch from that monologic to the dialogic mode. Because then you're actually conversing with each other. Then they report back to the instructor or the whole class, but the actual interaction has been distributed to that video chat venue. Yes. 
Yeah, so the question is about using Big Blue Button in Canvas. Uh, you have to use that for a whole class if you're larger than uh, 9 or 10 or whatever the Google Hangout limit is. Uh, but for small groups, everybody prefers Google Hangout. Um, and we actually don't require any synchronous live video sessions for the entire class uh, because we have the face-to-face -face component when they're on campus and we want the rest to be as flexible to their schedule as much as possible. So when we do have required video components, if it's small group, uh, most people prefer to stick with Google Hangout and that's what we've done. Uh, but maybe some of you have tried the big blue button and used that, use that uh, as well. It's nice because it's built right in. So in all these, you see how we're raising the stakes. There's more at stake for a student contribution than the average discussion thread. To think about that a little bit more, how could we make the student feel that something of greater importance is going on with their contribution? What if they posted their post to a public blog instead of the private, self-contained uh, uh, contribution within Canvas? What if they found a blog of an author or expert or some particular topic, made their post there, and there you know that somebody actually is going to see it, other than the professor or a peer. Somebody might reply to it. The author or blogger might see it. Um, and you can grab the permalink and submit it in Canvas. Submit by URL is one of the assignment settings. Um, so you're actually participating in a public venue. Similarly, social media. You could do a whole idea box just about Twitter, and people have. I've linked to some examples there, 70 ideas for Twitter. Um, at the very least, this idea of synthesizing some idea, some concept, some insight that you've had resulting from, uh, from class uh, in 140 characters or less. Our students are going to have to do it outside the classroom because so much communication happens that way. Why not build that into their learning? Sky's the limit with social media. Yes? The question is about FERPA concerns when students post to public, uh, uh, public blogs and social media. Yeah, that's huge. Frankly, we haven't done enough of this to really encounter that or really wrestle with that the way we need to. Um, but for our, our students, we know that the, many have said to us, we prefer a closed private area because we feel freer. If I put something on a public blog, and somebody two years ago who is looking, or two years from now, who might want to hire me is looking at what I posted, and maybe it's on a controversial topic, that becomes an issue. So we've got to find the balance between the f students feeling free within the private space and students getting that sort of public validation in the public space. Um, and that's a pedagogical issue, and it's a legal issue as well, certainly. Comment? I didn't catch the name of it, sorry. Today's Meet? Top Hat. Yep. Yep, so there are a lot of different tools you can use. Let me run through a few more and then we'll get to more of your ideas. Uh, group annotated reading. I was thinking of this. Think about how much I love the speed grader in Canvas and the Crocodoc annotation. I went to the Crocodoc website, uploaded a PDF and started making the same kind of comments uh, just, on, uh, just on a PDF and wondering what would happen if we actually had a reading assignment, a group reading assignment, where students actually had to interact in the actual margins of the reading itself. Reading is one of the most isolating things we ask students to do. It's one of the lowest stakes things we ask students to do. Could we change that? And now I'm hopeful because Box.com has bought Crocodoc. And Canvas is switching later this year, this summer, I think, to box.com for its document previewer. Is the day coming where we could embed any PDF and any content page and get that suite of tools? I'm hopeful. But even if not, I was thinking about this and thinking that really Google Docs does something similar. You can turn on comments and you can get a conversation going in the margins. I just noticed something the other day that I hadn't noticed before that you can click a, a little thread inside the Google Docs comments someone can click resolve to effectively close the thread. Um, maybe that could cause problems if it gets in the wrong hands, but it's just, a little, uh, it's just a little feature that they offer. In any case, how could we make reading assignments more collaborative, more meaningful? A couple ideas related to changing students' rhetorical voice. This comes from a book uh, by Conrad and Donaldson called Engaging the Online Learner. 
put the reference there. Um, try to express something you've learned in the form of a bumper sticker. They give extra credit if you design the bumper sticker. I've linked to a couple online bumper sticker generators. I, they don't say whether or not they give extra credit if you put the bumper sticker on your car. But the idea is that it's actually hard to articulate something in that rhetorical format, which is so condensed and has to achieve a lot rhetorically in a small space. But start thinking about, uh, if you were teaching, say, in a history class, the American Revolution, how would the loyalists have expressed their position at the time in bumper stickers? How, how would the rebels have, have expressed their feelings? Um, that's a rhetorically difficult thing to do. Now, if you feel like this is getting superficial or students are just blowing it off, then you might have to add some other element to the assignment. But get students responding in a different, in a different voice. Similarly, Conrad and Donaldson, rather ambitiously, I think, suggest assigning a poetic written form to summarize a theory. The expression, or the example they give, is to use the Seals and Ritchie evaluation subdomain set, and according to each item in that subdomain, or each subdomain item, uh, express something in the poetic sin cane format, in this case, the process of making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We're a long way from the conventional discussion thread now. This might be a little too ambitious, but the point is different things are possible. And the point is this is difficult, rhetorically. I, I could write you the paragraph summary for this without a second thought. But here I have to craft it. I have to shape it. I have to think about it. There are group possibilities, too, whether different people take different lines or say, oh, maybe here's a different way to say that in three words. There are possibilities out there. To emphasize oral presentation, so much of the online environment is, is so text-based, and students just feel barraged by this avalanche of text that we give them. Uh, one of the quickest things you can do that's very effective is to have a video thread. So in some of our courses, a certain week, you have your discussion question, but your post is a video post. This is a screenshot from one of our courses with a witness protection for FERPA purposes. Um, but it's so easy to just click your video icon, connect to your webcam, make your post. And you get to see and hear students, which is so essential in the potentially impersonal online environment. You even get to see them in their kitchen or in the library. It sort of sets, sets a scene. Um, and it even achieves some of the elements of a synchronous video session. It's certainly not all. Certainly there's more back and forth in a synchronous session. Um, but the ability to see and hear people without some of the liabilities of the video conferences when you run into the connection issues and people blipping out or not showing up, we like what we gain from this format. Question? Do you give video feedback as well? Uh, yeah, sometimes. We also encourage professors to give a video wrap-up to a text discussion. So all the text threads run their course, and the professor does a video. Um, it's very natural for the professor then to do a wrap-up here in video. Um, sometimes that happens, sometimes not. Uh, a few ideas I'll blaze through really quick and then get to yours. Visual fluency, get students thinking visually. Uh, what if the response came in the form of finding or taking a photo that expressed something? Group possibilities here as well. Then students could interact about what they see in the photo. Concept mapping with the ovals and the, uh, the branches that show abstract relationships uh, to get students out of thinking uh, in such a linear way. Deep skimming. This is an idea one of our professors had saying, I have 20 books of leadership about leadership on my desk. It's not worth reading all 20, but I'll give this one to you, this one to you, this one to you, this one to you. Everybody read yours for an hour. Absorb what you can in that space, and then report back to the class what you learned from it. Nobody's going to read all 20. It might not even be worth reading all 20 cover to cover, but there are insights to be mined from a wider stack of, in, of resources. That's why we call it wider net. The tool that is ideally suited for this is Google Books, because there are so many books out there, not all, that have extensive previewable se uh, sections um, online. Scavenger hunts, web quests, maybe you've tried these. Go find what's out there on the web. Find a YouTube scene that captures a certain theme or insight. I found a couple databases that I linked to there that categorize certain scenes from movies or TV shows by theme, justice, companionship, things like that. Uh, to get students having to think through a narrative um, rather than a conventional nonfiction source. All right, 
There's more where that came from. You get the idea. But what we're really getting at is not just shaking things up, but getting at these deeper skills, these deeper proficiencies. Because it's more than just assignments and tasks and credits. It's really about saying, how do we cultivate proficiencies tied to long-term uh, learning outcomes that will actually make an impact? There's more where these came from. Conrad and Donaldson, Engaging the Online Learner. There's a book called Empowering Online Learning. I'll give you 53 ideas for free. If you want 100, you've got to buy a book. <laughs> but the truth is that the best generator of ideas is you. Take these and run with them, adapt them, change them, say, well, what if we did it that way? All right, so what ideas are you curious about? Would you like to try? Would you not like to try? What have you tried in your online courses that has gone well or hasn't gone well that you've learned from? Uh, let's keep uh, filling the idea box. Yes? Yes. And it's a good thing that you said, don't do that in text, but this way all the students can see each other in person even, and maybe they are. And as you said, just ask that to each other. Absolutely. Video introductions. We have students, uh, we assign them to make sure that their profile in Canvas is up to date. Um, and that's where you can put everything about where you're from and wife and kids and all that. But the video introduction is a more personal introduction that helps uh, establish the space as a little more personal. Voice thread? Right, voice thread. And remember, Canvas has the built in audio as well. You could do an audio thread that way. Yep, Peter. So using VoiceThread to connect students across courses. Love it. Other ideas? Yes? Two things we've done, uh, at least in our management class, is we have uh, students online in the different studio programs and all over the U.S. One, uh, we did a uh, sexual inventory, and we had students go into their own closet to put their top three brands, and then we did a pie chart. So students that are living in Florida, you're going to see a lot of sugar and yep. students that are living up in North So surveying brands by looking at brands in your own closet and going to stores around you and seeing things there and capturing that. Yep. Yes. Big blue button for collaborative group presentations that can be recorded and presented to the class. That's a huge game. I like that a lot. Yep. Okay, recordings are temporary. Might have to go with Camtasia. can pay to get big blue bar button recorded, uh, recordings archived. Thanks so much. There's a ton of ideas. Uh, keep the brainstorming going and uh, get creative in online learning. Thank you.